All right. Welcome back to the, we're going to just going to call it the Healthy and Whole podcast for now until we come up with a better name, which we may never. But today we're going to talk through four client questions that we get a lot. Uh, and these are pretty mindset related questions, things that prevent people from ever completing the journey and getting to where they want to be with their weight, with their body, with their health. I'll go ahead and intro the four questions so that you can kind of know what's coming, give you a little preview, but then we're going to take them one at a time. So first question we're going to go into is how do you stay motivated for the long haul when the excitement, the new newness of whatever you're trying wears off. Then the next one is getting comfortable when you still need to keep pushing. What happens when you start to kind of get complacent? You get some results under your belt and a lot of people start to let the foot off the gas when that happens. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to go through how to go from setback to comeback. What do you do when life happens and you get totally knocked off your game and you're starting to struggle to get back on track? How do you do that? And then lastly, how to deal with other people's perceptions Ooh, and comments regarding your journey. This is a huge one that people like really, really struggle with when you're doing something, it's working and everybody wants to give their opinions and, you know, tell you whether you should lose more weight, whether you should stop saying losing weight and they're giving you compliments uh, is going to be such a good one. I can't wait to dive into that one. Disclaimer, we did not bullet point anything out. We're just totally going to wing this. Totally winging it. This is going to be raw and uh, unscripted and unbullet pointed and intimate. Uh, this is going to be, I'm excited. Let's get Thrilled. intimate together. Yeah. <laughs> let's do it, man. <laughs> All right. Let's start. Let's start with this first one. Um, staying motivated for the long haul. Um, man, this one is, is something I think that we see a lot. We, we, uh, we actually prepare our clients for the fact that this is uh, something that all clients go through when they enter the program. We actually tell them that you're going to go through different seasons of your journey uh, and the four seasons of the journey that we kind of prepare people for are called uh, hope, uh, the pit, the climb, and the mountaintop. And that like hope phase is that phase where they're super excited. Yep. Ready to get started. Woohoo! Let's go. Gonna change my life. <laughs> and uh, there's all that new excitement, right? Because they're trying something new. Um, they're trusting the process. They're excited about it. It's like, it's like when you get anything new. Yeah. You get a new car, you're excited about it. Oh yeah, hundred percent. You know, um, and but that weighs that wears off. Mm-hmm. Like that only lasts for so long. That newness, that novelty only lasts for so long. And then that's where people uh, end up going into what we call the pit, which is where they're faced with the reality that they still have a long way to go. It's gonna take longer than they thought it was gonna take. Right. It's gonna be harder than they thought it was gonna be. Um, there are some doors that they didn't realize were open that they need to close or doors that were closed that they didn't realize they need to open. I mean, both vice versa, yeah. both, right. There, there are things that basically that they, they, they probably came into it thinking I'm going to learn about food. I'm going to work out. Yep. I'm going to do some, sh- some shallow surface level things to get my results. And then they get into it and they're like, holy crap, I actually need to like make foundational deeper change, yeah. uh, in my life. And so that motivation wears off and they can start to struggle, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Especially if they don't know um, how to overcome some of the resistance and some of the, like, the monsters that they might start encountering as they actually really start to confront what has kept them from being successful in the past. Because most people come in to work, when they come to work with us, most of them have tried many, many, many different things before they come to work with us. Like, they... um, it's not uncommon at all for people to say, I've tried everything. Yep. Tried every pill, every supplement, every workout program. Weight Watchers. Weight Watchers. Yeah. Tried every diet. Um, what's that other one? Noom. Tried Noom. Yep. yep. Atkins. You know, Optavia, Atkins, Keto, uh, Carnivore Diet. Yeah. Paleo. Paleo. Uh, intermittent Fasting. Yeah. Tried everything. None of, it, none of it has worked for me. And... We're always super upfront with people right then and there that, hey, there's probably some deeper things going on that have, because all these things actually work mm-hmm. to get results. They're not sustainable in the way that they need to be. There mm-hmm. are things that are missing from them to make it actually 100% sustainable. And that actually kind of speaks into part of why the motivation becomes such a problem, right? A lot of people come in and they start something that they 100%, maybe not 100%, that they hope will get them results, mm-hmm. right? That's why they tried all these other things. Their hope is, hey, this will be the thing that's going to get me the results. 
but they're very results focused. Yeah. They're not long term sustainability focused. So a lot of times they're picking something to do that they don't actually enjoy yeah. doing. They don't like doing it. Like they pick a diet. Hey, I heard or I saw on YouTube that this diet is is uh, it's the buzz right now. Everybody's doing it and they're getting results. Mm-hmm. That same group of people will be doing something else mm-hmm. in six months to a year. And then six months later to a year later, they'll be doing something else. They'll be doing something else. We got to start looking at the people who just did it. Yeah. And then they, that was it, mm-hmm. right? Which is where we're focused with our clients when we're working with them. But it speaks to why do we struggle with motivation mm-hmm. for the long haul? I think there's a lot of different facets to this. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when we first, like during our first podcast, we talked about like the four different kinds of motivation. I think that goes into play too. Um, you know, everyone's got some sort of goal that they're working towards, whether it's extrinsic, um, you know, the identified and trajectory mm-hmm. were the two that you mentioned. Yeah. And then there's the intrinsic. Mm-hmm. And I think for, for most people, when they start, it's mostly extrinsic, you know, it's just kind of yeah. like they want to get to a certain, um, aesthetic or they want to, you know, lose a certain amount of pounds or, you know, they want to, um, you know, look this way for the summertime or the a wedding or what have you. So, um, a lot of it's extrinsic, but then once they get into, you know, the middle of this journey and then realize how hard it is, they get to that pit level mm-hmm. of the, the four D's, uh, that gets real, real hard for, uh, for, uh, motivation and everything. So, yeah. So what you're saying is basically they're starting off with the wrong type of motivators to begin with, which I 100% agree with. Yeah. Right. It, it, and we've seen that a lot. Someone might say, if I ask them why they want to join the program or why they want to lose weight, we get all sorts of great, great answers to that. But sometimes it's, well, I have a wedding coming up in June mm-hmm. and, or my son's getting married or my daughter's getting married, or, uh, we have a vacation beach vacation coming up in August. And yeah, those are motivating to an extent, but their motivation is very limited. And, um, it's, it's, it's not a deeper sense of motivation. It's certainly not a type of motivation that will, that will carry you through for the rest of your life. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so starting with the wrong types of motivation is I think what you're saying is what gets people into trouble. And I 100% agree with that. Um, you really have to come into it with a long term mindset, asking yourself, why haven't I stuck with all these things that I did in the past? Mm Mm-hmm. If you ask that question, 99% of the time you're going to come around to the answer is that I just didn't like any of those things. Yeah. I didn't enjoy running. I, I didn't enjoy CrossFit or whatever it was. Um, I didn't enjoy the keto diet. Um, yes, it got me results. And I was able to do it for a short period of time because it got me results. But eventually I got really fatigued and bored or just disgusted with it. It didn't have the excitement, the variety, the enjoyment, the things that speak to much deeper types of motivation, like intrinsic motivation. Yeah. Right. Intrinsic motivation is I do the thing because I just want to do the thing. Yeah. Right. I love doing the thing. I love the experience of doing the thing. Nobody has to motivate someone to sit on the couch and watch their favorite shows on Netflix. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's fun. Mm -hmm. Nobody has to motivate you to sit down and play play uh, video games. Yeah. Right. I love it. You know, what's your favorite video game? Oh, man. That's a. That's a hard question. I mean, I think one game that I could play for hours upon hours is probably Skyrim. I could play that game forever, but um, uh, I lost a lot of hours yeah, in in, yeah. in my life to That's Skyrim. A good, That's a good one. Once man. upon a time, it's an old one too. Yeah. But but all that is just to say that like nobody ever has to tell you or push you or hold you accountable mm-hmm. to sit down and play Skyrim. Yeah, you. It's fun. Yeah, it's enjoyable. It's it's. It may not be productive or fulfilling, but not everything we do in life needs to be productive or fulfilling, Mm -hmm. right? Um, You know, a lot of people come into a weight loss journey and they'll say things like, you know, when I ask them what are their goals, one of their goals sometimes will be, I want to be someone who just eats for fuel, not for pleasure. And I always, that's a red flag to me Mm -hmm. because eating Let's be realistic. We don't live in a world where anybody eats for fuel. Yeah. 
there are like very, 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 very few people, like 1% of the world that, that are that way, that they just eat for fuel. Maybe 10%. I'd say one in 10. I feel like, <laughs> I feel like those who do are like third world countries. Like it's for survival. That's yeah. Well, if you live in the United States, that's not a thing. Like well, <laughs> everyone eats for pleasure at some point. Yeah. It, or there are, there are some, what I would, I call them freaks out there, you know, but they're, sure. they're hardcore competitors, physique competitors, Liver like King. people who like, yeah, they they literally <laughs> make their living off of a, a, off of what they do. Yeah. Right. And, and that's, but that's not normal people. Mm -hmm. Normal people aren't like that. Normal people have families. They have friends. They have social lives, church groups, you know, work and coworkers and work events. Real life does not jive with I eat for fuel. Mm -hmm. Now, there's other things that complicate it, right? Emotional eating, stress eating is probably why people come around to that and say, well, I just want to be able to eat for fuel, not for pleasure. But the reality is they're not eating for pleasure. Mm -hmm. They're eating for relief. Mm -hmm. So when you remove emotional eating and stress eating from the equation, you actually can just eat for pleasure. Mm -hmm. When you're eating the right foods at the right times for the right reasons, mm -hmm. you, become, you can become a logical eater and enjoy your favorite foods at the right times and the right amounts and the right reasons. And that can be motivating for yeah. you for the long haul. Mm -hmm. So it's not about coming into something and... and so two, two things we've identified here. One trying to motivate yourself with the wrong things right. is not going to work. Motivating yourself with results, which would cause you to do things that you don't like to do to get the results, is going to, it's going to face plant very quickly. Yeah. Um, trying to motivate yourself with a wedding or a vacation or some sort of deadline or external event, uh, extrinsic you know, reward, is not going to motivate you. Mm -hmm. You really have to backtrack to intrinsic... Or, or what we would call identified motivators, which yeah. are, I, I love to do these things, or I see so much long-term value in them mm -hmm. that I will do them even if I don't love doing them, right? right? Like cleaning the house, yeah. right? If you don't want to live in a pigsty like a hoarder, you will continuously clean your house, mm -hmm. right? That's an identified motivator. So if you want to stay motivated for the long haul, I think what we're getting at is you have to start with a long-term mindset. Yep. And you really have to put your focus from the very, very beginning on building the the uh, achieving the results and building the lifestyle through the filter or the lens of what would I still be excited to do and what could I sustain mm -hmm. uh, through the rest of my life? Yeah. For the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, however old you are, what could I still do? What would I still love to be doing from a dietary standpoint, from an exercise standpoint, an activity standpoint when I'm 80 years old? Yeah. Yeah. And, and to be fair, these days uh, with all the medical advancements, which I think are just going to go through the roof, you know, AI is like the big thing now. Yeah. A lot of people don't understand how much AI is going to change innovation um, here, here very soon. AI, this is just one of the facets that AI will really change, is AI will be able to help uh, achieve rapid breakthroughs in a lot of different industries and in technology and in medical, in the medical field. And so the next probably like 10 to 20 years, we're probably going to experience some crazy breakthroughs that will allow human beings to live far beyond the, what is now the expected life expectancy for, for human beings. So like if the, I don't know what it is, what the statistic is now for the, the, the basic life expectancy for a human being, probably like in the seventies, um, that's going to get much longer, that's right? Crazy. So we really do have to think, you know, what, what do I want to eat? What, what, like, you know, and you have to build that from day one. Right. Um, Alex Ormosi, you guys hear me talk about Alex all the time. Um, he's just a smart guy. But he, he says, if you wouldn't do it for a decade, don't do it for a day. And I would actually extrapolate that out and just say, if you wouldn't do it for the rest of your life, don't waste a day trying to do something because your motivation will not sustain that. Right. Right. There is a caveat to that, though. Mm -hmm. I will say. 
So when it comes to like, and, and this is mostly for working out. I mean, like with nutrition and everything, obviously so some of that's going to take time, but when it comes to, you know, exercise, you, you're going to have to do something like more than once to really know if you're going to like it or not, or mm -hmm. it's something that you truly enjoy. Cause yeah, no, nothing like starting brand new. There's a yeah. few things like when you start fresh, you're like super excited about, and it's like, wow, this is awesome. But yep. when it's, Mostly when it comes to working out or exercise, you know, it's not the most exciting thing in the world because you're new and, you know, most people when they haven't worked out in a long time, they're, they're bad at it. So yep. it's not fun. It's like you recognize just how far off you're, you are, or, you know, just how far along you've got to go. Um, mm -hmm. But patience is also key there when it comes to the, the motivation factor. You know, you got to take time and, and really put in the reps to see if you enjoy something thoroughly. Um, but it does kind of circle back around to that enjoyment factor. That is the most important thing ever. But you would need to have the patience to find that enjoyment. So no, I think that's very wise, um, and it at, it really speaks to like I, I've given the analogy of like learning something, any mm -hmm. really learning anything, but learning. Let's say learning guitar, right? I use that because I'm a guitar player. In the beginning, I didn't have. It was, it was a fun thing to, to tinker with in the beginning, but I wasn't really having a ton of fun. In fact, I was probably having more frustration than fun in the beginning when I first started playing guitar, but I had to stick with it. Like, you, like what you're saying is you have to stick with things long enough for you to become proficient enough or for the enjoyment factor to raise to the threshold where it becomes intrinsic. Right. And then here's, here's an interesting thing, thing though too about motivation is that there are some things that no matter what you do, they might be super valuable. Like let's, let's take strength training. Strength, strength training is something that a lot of women in particular just don't want to do. They don't love doing it. It's not exciting for them. And I personally, even though I own a gym and I run a coaching program, I do not love the experience of strength training. <gasps> oh my gosh, I gasp. You know, what? I, I actually do struggle and have struggled for many years to really tackle the motivation, you know, to go and to, to strength train. I love, and I deeply value the end results. I love the way I look and the way I feel mm -hmm. because I strength train and I would not look or, or, or feel the way I look and feel, uh, in the ways that I enjoy if I didn't strength train. Mm -hmm. So I have to do it. And because I value it so much, I, I, for a lot of years, I've been able to get myself, motivate myself to do it because of the value that I see in it. Mm -hmm. You know, even just the fact that I, I can't, I have to look the part if I'm going to own a gym and run the business, right. right. And attract clients. I can't be the trainer or the coach or the, the gym owner who is, is really overweight and, and unhealthy and expect people to trust me as an authority, you know, to like, teach them how to change their lives. Like having a dentist with bad teeth. Right. Yeah. You, I, I, you can't do that. But, um, but I've, I spent a lot of years motivating myself to strength train because I just saw the value in it. And I knew that if I didn't do it, it would really hurt in a lot of ways. Yeah. But recently I have found ways to turn strength training into something that I actually love to go do. And I, what's interesting about it is I still don't love strength training. But what I did is I did, I, and I'm sure other people have um, like their na other names. I, I didn't come up with this. I'm just giving it a name that I that works for my brain. I call it layering. And what I do is I take something like strength training, which is an activity that I highly value but don't intrinsically love the actual experience of doing strength training, and I layer other intrinsically rewarding activities that I can do at the same time I'm strength training. So like for instance... There are three things. Number one, um, I, I sort of decrease the threshold of of the pain of strength training because I hate the idea. I'm a very time. Time is my most valuable asset. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I recognized was keeping me was decreasing my motivation to go and strength train was the fact that I had to like pack my clothes. I had to take my gym bag to the gym. I had to go there, like change clothes, do my workout change again so that I could be back into my work clothes to handle like appointments with clients and stuff like that. Cause I just don't like wearing, you know, workout clothes all day long. Uh, you know, like all that stuff. So I just stopped doing it. So now what do I do? 
I literally work out in jeans <laughs> and a t-shirt and your sneakers. You're a monster. I am monster. like, I'm that guy who everybody's like, he owns this gym yeah. and he's working out in <laughs> holy jeans and a V-neck. He's got, he's got his church jeans or a, t- a tank top and, and <laughs> chucks. Yeah, I do. You know why? I don't care what anybody thinks. Boom. It works for me. Mm-hmm. I, what other people think is none of my business. So I decreased the pain threshold of strength training by removing that factor altogether. So now I'm just like, if I'm at my desk at the gym and I'm like, I, I got time to get a workout in, I just get up and I go work out and I come back. And it, I'm lucky because I don't sweat. Mm-hmm. And our gym is super cold. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> We keep it like 68 degrees in there. So I have to really push super hard for me to like sweat. Um, so I can get away with it, yeah. right? Other people sweat a lot. They wouldn't be able to get away with it. Um, they'd have to change clothes, but yeah. yeah, for sure. I can get away with it. But so I decreased the pain threshold, which is, I think, a lesson we can learn about maintaining motivation for the long term. Mm-hmm. If you want to stay motivated, especially with things that aren't necessarily inherently intrinsically motivating for you because you don't love the experience of them, find ways to decrease the pain mm-hmm. of doing them. And then the other thing is you layer intrinsically rewarding things in with it. So what do I do? I work out in, in the clothes I want to work out, decrease the pain threshold. And then we, we our gym is directly uh, in the same parking lot as a McDonald's. <laughs> so, Dude, it's torture for some people. So I <laughs> literally, but I love me a good, large, fountain McDonald's Coke Zero. Coke Zero. A Coke Zero. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Greg. Uh, what's his name? Greg, Greg Doucet. Greg Doucet. Coach Greg. Coach Greg Doucet on, on YouTube. We love we love to do impressions of Greg. So I love a good a cocazito, and uh, so I will literally before I work out, I will walk over to the McDonald's, walk in, get a large Coke Zero, bring it back, and I will drink my large Coke Zero while I'm working out. Again, people are probably looking at me and being like. Who is this guy? Mm-hmm. He owns a gym. He runs a coaching program. He's drinking what I, I, they don't even know it's Coke Zero. They're probably like, he's drinking a Coke, yeah. a large Coke from McDonald's <laughs> while he's working out in jeans and a V neck. But you know what? It really works for me, mm-hmm. right? It's zero calorie. I thoroughly enjoy it. And because I get to look now, I've, I, because I love drinking that Coke Zero, I kind of look forward to going to work out a little bit more than I used to because I know I get to have that little treat, Mm -hmm. right? And then the next thing that I layer on top of that is I love YouTube. I love watching YouTube videos. I love listening to podcasts. But again, I'm a very time efficient, um, focused person. So it's difficult for me to listen to entertainment type uh, or, or watch entertainment focused YouTube videos and podcasts over listening to personal development and, and like self growth type content. Because I feel like, um, when I'm deep down, I feel like when I'm listening to something that's just entertaining, I'm wasting time. Mm -hmm. I'm wasting valuable time that I could be learning. So I beat myself up when I waste time sometimes listening to something that's just for entertainment. Mm -hmm. But in order to, to raise the intrinsic level of me wanting to go strength train, what I do is I layer the Coke Zero, and then I, get, I allow myself to listen to purely entertaining YouTube videos and podcasts and different things like that while I'm working out. So now I have two new things layered in with strength training that I, that I don't really get all the time outside of strength training, and now I don't want to miss strength training as much. Yeah. And it doesn't take so much to get me to go do it. Mm-hmm. So... Recap on long-term motivation before we move on. We spent way more time on this than I think we meant to, but That's I think okay. it's but I think it's really important. Yeah. You know, um, recap on this: pick the right motivators from the beginning. Don't pick external motivators, and um, really focus on the enjoyment. Yes, of everything that you're doing. Give yourself time yes. to develop enjoyment. Use layering to to increase the intrinsic motivation of the things that you're doing. Be really clear on the value of the things that you're doing so that even if you don't have that level of intrinsic motivation layered in with them yet, or or those things aren't intrinsically motivating, you at least value them enough that you will do them. Mm -hmm. And then um, the other thing I said was decrease the pain threshold of the things that you need need to do to be successful. Yeah. 
And there, there's a lot more to this discussion. We really could make have made this entire podcast discussion just about this one question. But for the sake of hitting some of these other on this list before we run out of time, um, I think we'll move on to the next one. But hopefully there were some tips in there that I think will help people. Yeah. Uh, the next one here is getting comfortable when you still need to keep pushing. Ooh, that's a good one. Complacency. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, and, and really what I think this comes down to is letting good be the enemy of great. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think about Pam, or one of our clients, Pam. Pam, we just posted about her last night on Facebook and her success journey with us. She's been working with us going on about two years now. And she's lost about 50 pounds. She is 60 going on 61 years old. She's a beast. And she's a beast. Now, If you look at her before picture, I'll throw up her before pictures onto the screen here so you can see who we're talking about. You look at her before picture, a 60-year-old female coming in to work with us uh, with 50 pounds that she wants to lose. Uh, She didn't know she wanted to lose 50 pounds. She thought maybe I need to lose 30 pounds or something like that. Um, And she had type 2 diabetes coming in, a fresh diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, uh, A1C around 7.6 at the time. Um, And being at 60, she was a few years post-menopause, right? Mm -hmm. So she came in to the program and she had a lot of uh, doubts, you know, about what she could accomplish because she had the false beliefs in her head, like, I'm 60, or you know, at the time she was, I don't know, 59, right? 58, 59. Um, she was, but she's, I'm postmenopause. I have type two diabetes. I'm getting older. She had all this stuff in her head um, telling her why she couldn't probably achieve what she really would love to achieve, right? The great, right? The, the, like, she probably just thought, I'm going to get a little bit better. I'm going to lose some weight and I'm going to get to a place where I don't feel like I'm miserable, where I can just, be ha- you know, be alive and live and not be miserable like I feel like I am right now. But she probably didn't necessarily think that she could ever get to where she is right now. When you look at her her other her her most recent picture that I have up on the screen right now, she is shredded. Mm-hmm. Like she's jacked. she's she's I wouldn't say jacked, but I, for I a sixty year old jacked. female, like we posted and and all the comments were like they I we have arm envy mm-hmm. right because she looks amazing yeah right. But would Pam look the way she looks today in this after picture if she would have stopped when she felt good? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people run into this. So many people run into this. Um, It's also part of when we talk about the client journey, the four stages of the client journey that people go through, hope, the pit, the climb, the mountaintop. Part of being in the pit or being in the climb out of the pit is you've made enough progress to the point where you no longer feel miserable anymore. And when you first start off a journey, I think that's probably one of the most motivating things for people Mm -hmm. because they're miserable, Mm -hmm. right? They hate the way they look. They hate the way they feel. A lot of people, they have health issues that are really scary for them when they're first starting off. Maybe they had a health scare and they're, they're like, I will do anything. And then they pick a, diet like keto to go back to the last point Mm -hmm. you know i I don't care just tell me what to do i'll do it i can't be here anymore but that's very motivating for them but when you've lost 20 pounds even if you have 100 pounds to lose when you've lost your first 20 or 30 and people start noticing and your clothes are fitting a little bit looser and your knees are hurting a little bit less and your energy and all that stuff is improving, you're feeling better because you're eating better and you're hydrating better and you're doing the things, that discomfort and that pain that used to motivate you is not there as much. Is not there as much, yeah. right? So you start to get comfortable. Yeah. Right? Yeah, definitely. I think with... Uh, yeah, when people usually lose... it you know, really depends on, on the person, of course, but when they get to us, maybe like halfway to their goal, Mm -hmm. um, or their initial goal 
and then they start getting all kinds of compliments or, you know, reassurance from people like, oh, you're doing such a great job. Like, yeah, yeah, you look great now. And then, you know, in their subconscious mind, they're like, oh, well, I guess that's it. And then they just get comfortable and, um, you know, kind of find find a hard reason. It was like that uh, yesterday when I sent you the, uh, you know, reason why people don't always reach their goal. It was like a lack of clarity around four things. It's whether where they're going they're not exactly sure on where they need to need to go or where they want to be yep um how to get there Mm -hmm. some people might know where they need to go but don't really know the the implementation or um the process to get there yep and then um then a lot of people struggle with the why Mm -hmm. they just don't understand why they want to get there whether it's just for aesthetic purposes or whether it's you know to continue to be a healthy person yep um you know sometimes when you have just more of a selfish why it's not very yeah. motivating to get you to keep going yep um and then maybe they know all those three things but then they don't know what's holding them back or what's yeah. what exactly is in their way um so i think that's a a big reason why a lot of people get to a, a like their halfway point and then just stop and it's really uh yeah really discouraging getting there and then people telling you you did such a great job yeah. And then you got in your mind, oh, well, this is good enough, but then you're not really happy. Yeah. This actually happens all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, we we experience this, and we have to coach people through this all the time because in a, in, you end up being very frustrated because you can literally be sitting there saying, I'm not happy, but yet I'm acting like I'm in maintenance. Mm-hmm. Like you may be, maybe, let's say you had 50 pounds to lose. You lose your first 20 you logically know you would love to lose that next 30. But all of a sudden, you're having trouble motivating yourself to keep going. And you're acting as though you're in maintenance. And why does that happen? Well, like you said, interestingly enough, it starts to happen when you start to get people noticing and you start to get compliments and your clothes start to fit looser and you're starting to feel a little bit better. And the motivation, what was really motivating you in the beginning becomes very apparent, mm-hmm. right? What did we say in the first question where we talked about motivation? That extrinsic motivators are very unreliable yep. in the long term. So if you've made 20 pounds out of your 50-pound goal worth of progress, and now all of a sudden because your spouse and your friends or your other acquaintances, your coworkers, whoever it might be, is noticing and they're giving you compliments and now you're letting the foot off the gas, what that should tell you is that you were very extrinsically motivated. You were doing it for the love, appreciation, recognition mm-hmm. of others. Deep down, that is truly what you started primarily motivated by. If you want to keep going, beyond this better state, you might not even be to a place where you actually do feel good, and you're certainly not to a place where you feel great, but if you wanna push through that and not let comfort hold you back, you have to shift yourself from those extrinsic motivators, accept them, right? The compliments are great, like it's great that you're 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 being seen as being successful and people are, are, are saying those things, but that won't get you all the way to where you actually logically know that you would really like to be. Mm -hmm. Um, So then you have to really transition yourself to identified and intrinsic motivators, meaning you you see the value Mm -hmm. of being all the way at that 50 pound goal. Um, And then you're doing things that you like to do to get there, right? One of the, what you're gonna notice as we talk through all of these is that all of these are interconnected. Yeah, We picked these four questions for a reason because they're all interconnected. Mm -hmm. When you start to struggle with motivation and you get comfortable and you still need to keep pushing, the fact that you need to keep pushing tells you what's wrong already. Yeah, You don't have to push yourself to sit on the couch and watch your favorite shows on Netflix. Nobody has to push Colton to sit down and play hours of Skyrim. Right. If anything, we have to be pushed not yes. to do those things. So again, 
if you are struggling and getting comfortable and struggling to keep going and having feeling like, feeling like you have to push yourself or be pushed by someone else to do the things that you need to do to get that last 30 pounds off, well, that's a red flag that you are doing things that you have not re- yet reached the level of enjoyment, variety, excitement, um, intrinsic motivating you know, threshold or, or you don't see the value. In the in in the end goal enough yet to keep going, yeah. so you're having to push yourself, right? But that's why we 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 sort of preach: start from day one, learning how to eat foods that you legitimately really enjoy to get the results. You're going to have to do less pushing, mm-hmm. if any pushing, when you start to get comfortable. You'll just keep doing the stuff because you enjoy doing the stuff, and the results will keep coming in, mm-hmm. right? Um. But then you said something, you said the why, right? Mm-hmm. People are not clear on the why. Yeah. And I think that's really important because in the initially, you know, they may have said they were clear on their why, but mm-hmm. if they were really clear on their why, they would not be feeling comfortable mm-hmm. and complacent 20 pounds into a 50 pound goal, mm-hmm. right? Because they don't look the way they think that they want to look mm-hmm. after 20 pounds. They don't feel really the way, they're not capable of doing the things that they want to be able to do after 20 pounds. So you've got to ask yourself, not only why do I feel like I have to keep pushing myself, which should inform you, you know, what are the things that I'm doing that I really don't love and I need to do work around raising the enjoyment threshold of those things. But you also have to ask yourself, why do I really value? What are the many reasons why I would really, really value and enjoy going all the way. Mm-hmm. Like you said, you've got to have clarity around that. And if you don't have good clarity around that, it's not going to motivate you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I give the analogy of like, take Disney World, right? Disney World, there's a lot of reasons why I can get excited about going to Disney World. Just thinking about Disney World for me, going and seeing like the new Star Wars area because I'm a Star Wars geek, you know, um, like there's so much at Disney World that I could do that would be fun, right? The food, the experiences, like you being immersed in that environment, Mm -hmm. just thinking about it makes me want to go there. You've got to be able to think about that end goal, that 50 pound goal. And just like when I think about Disney, I can like, I can almost visualize what it would be like to go back there. Yeah. I can almost taste the food, you know? Um, I, I can just like, I can put myself there. If you can do that with that 50 pound goal and really experience in your mind what it's already like to be there, that can raise that motivation level for you and help you push through that comfort. Because, but you won't be able to do that if you're not really clear, mm-hmm. right? Like, listen to me talk about Disney. Right, I'm clear on why I want to go to Disney because I want to go check out the t- the Star Wars stuff. Right, I can think of all the different things that I want to do yeah. and all the different parks that are just, my favorite things. You're not just saying it's exciting. Like, I'm not just saying like, yeah, it'd be cool to go to Disney. Yeah, that's not exciting. But to go to Epcot and be able to do the whole around the world thing because I love going to all those different like parts of the world and sampling the different foods and and different stuff and and I love going to you know the Animal Kingdom and going on the little safari ride you know and seeing the rhinoceroses who like to sit in the middle of the dang road so you got to sit there excited man you got to sit there in the middle of the road for twenty minutes in the in the in ninety degree weather with no fans sweating your your butt off because the rhino decided to lay down in the middle of the road and we can't. <laughs> disturb the rhino, right? But it's fun, you know? And, and all the food and all the different things, like there's so much. That you hear this clarity that I'm speaking with about why I want to go back to Disney. Dang it, I need to, I need to book a Disney trip. <laughs> I'm actually really mad because Joni, uh, so my mom and, and, and I and my daughter Lachlan and Joni was supposed to go with us. We went to, to Disney last year. Yeah, that's right. Um, in September. And <laughs> Joni didn't get to go because she was very pregnant yes <laughs> at the time and she decided not to go because she was struggling with a, a lot of morning sickness and stuff so she didn't get to go it was really sad but we went and me and Lachlan and my mom had a great time so this year Joni's like uh Joni's sister invited her and Lachlan to go to Disney without me uh. 
They're going without me. Oh, man. So I'm super salty about it. Oof. Oh, well, yeah. You know what? Maybe we can go. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's, me and you, we're, Matt and Cole. Disney here. date. Here we go. Let's do bro it. Bro date. Disney yes. bro date. We're going to do it. We're going to film it. It's going to be fun. I love it. Um, but yeah, but seriously, so you hear the clarity that I'm speaking about this. Yeah. This is what you have to create in your own heart and in your own mind to help motivate you to move through complacent, comfort and complacency. Without that clarity, without that level of clarity that literally can raise that excitement, like you've got this mental brochure of all the amazing things that you will get to, to feel, experience, do, all of that stuff when you get to that ultimate goal. If you don't have that clarity, uh, not that you can't get there, mm-hmm. but you're gonna have to, it's gonna be harder to get yourself there especially if you're doing things that you don't love to do yeah, to get there. Yeah. So you see how this all works together. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 100%. But I think this is also a good segue to go into that one question, that, that third question we had about how to deal with other people's perceptions and comments regarding your journey and what you're doing, right? Because you already brought up that when people start giving you compliments, mm-hmm. one of the impacts of those compliments sometimes can be, oh, well, people are noticing uh, now you're thinking about what they're thinking and you're mulling over in your brain their perceptions of you. And then all of a sudden, you're allowing other people's perceptions of you to make decisions for you. Mm-hmm. Right? And this is something we see a lot. And it can surface in a lot of different ways. Uh, we definitely, like you said, we see folks who are like, well, I started getting compliments, so I let the foot off the gas. Yep. And I think that's just happening because they're, they were initially even if they didn't realize it, they were extrinsically motivated. They just wanted people to, to notice them yeah, or to get, you know, to feel more attractive or whatever it might be um, to get that love, recognition, acceptance, all that. And then once they start to fill that deeper human need, even though they're only 20 pounds in for a 50 pound goal or a hundred pound goal or whatever it is mm-hmm. like, okay, check the box. Mm-hmm. I'm good to go. But that's only like one category of the compl- of the comments that people get. Yeah. There's a whole other there's a whole world of things that people might say when you're on your journey. Mm-hmm. What are some things that you uh, you've experienced or heard uh, clients say or that have caught, you know, that other people have said about them or to them when they're on their journey that has really started to impact them and and cause them to struggle. I think first of all, I mean going back to our compliments thing, I think that really throws people off is that, you know, it kind of gets into their subconscious mind. Oh, mm-hmm. well, I'm doing good enough. This is, uh, mm-hmm. you know, where I need to be. I'm healthy. And this is, you know, that's it. Mm-hmm. I don't need to continue on. I'm maintenance mode turns on. Yep. I think the second one is kind of relating to the last one that we're going to talk about here. Mm-hmm. And that's some negative things that people might say. So like, oh, mm-hmm. well, you know, yep. this is not a healthy, you know, rate of weight loss. And, you know, you can't be eating foods like that. And that kind of bread's not good for you. And insert, oh, yeah. you know, other, you know, terrible dialogue there. But yeah, um, yeah, I think that also kind of sets people back as well. And um, the third thing is not really things that people say necessarily. Mm-hmm. Um, but when it comes to setbacks, it's mostly like things that happen like birthday parties or holidays. Yeah. Holidays are the big one. I think that, yeah. I mean, we've seen a lot of people have a huge setback. Um, mm-hmm. And I think the uh, another one um, that I've seen lately is surgeries. Surgeries mm-hmm. really set people back because mm-hmm. um, they just kind of lose their groove for a few weeks, you know, trying yeah. to recover from the surgery. Yeah. They, you know, all the stuff of like working out and, you know, getting yeah. their steps in and, um, you know, being not, or being aware of what they're, they're sure. eating just kind of goes out the window yeah. for a while. Yeah. But really where we're focused in here is, and that does, I think, show up with surgeries and stuff like that too, but it's like where people are, what people are saying can, can it shouldn't, but it tends to have a big impact on the oh, decision-making yeah. processes oh, yeah. and what we, what we do. Um, and it does show up in a lot of ways. So one way that I see this show up um, is you can get negative comments. Like um, I, I've had where clients have said, well, you know, my family member or my friend or my coworker, you know, poo-pooed all over what I'm doing, basically. Um, like I would never eat that. Or which, which is actually, that one doesn't happen too much anymore because 
most of our clients are losing weight eating tacos and quesadillas and French toast and biscuits and gravy because of all the recipes in the cookbook. Mm -hmm. But so that doesn't happen a whole lot anymore. But they they do say things like, "You don't need to lose any more weight. You look great." Mm -hmm. So let's just take that one for example, right? First of all, why would someone say that? Why would someone, when you have, if you've got someone in your life who they have a vision for what they want to accomplish with their health, they're not happy with where they're at right now, why would you go and tell them, you look great, you're perfect just the way you are, you don't need to lose any more weight? Mm -hmm. First of all, I'm going to ruffle some feathers here and I'm going to say, that's a really thing to say. Mm -hmm. And I, I shouldn't, I'm going to bleep that out <laughs> when I edit this because I don't want to get flagged by YouTube or anything like that. And I don't curse very much, but like, that's a really horrible thing to say to someone. Mm -hmm. First of all, it's none of your business, mm -hmm. right? It is none of your business. And all you are doing is inserting yourself into, into their heart and in their mind. And you're basically telling them that their hopes and their dreams and what they totally deserve to accomplish is not is not worth it mm -hmm. or it's not healthy or whatever and nine times out of ten the people saying this they're 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 one of two things number one they're not an expert mm -hmm. they have no idea what is healthy and what is not healthy and nine times out of ten the people saying these things are very unhealthy themselves yeah which brings in the whole scope of a lot of the comments that you get that would seem to be discouraging to you when it comes to you completing your journey and going all the way or, or continuing, you have to take into account human nature. Humans do not want to be alone. They don't want to, um, to feel... I'm not sure why there was an ant on my table, but that's interesting. Um, <laughs> They don't want to feel left behind. They don't want to feel like they um, are weak or won't be loved, like all that stuff. We have deep human needs and deep human fears around all of this stuff. So there's this deep human thing I think that happens when, you know, you let's say that you're overweight and your spouse or your best friend or, you know, whatever it is starts losing weight. And there's this. I think there's this deep thing that happens where you like you feel like you're being left behind, mm -hmm. right? And and if you don't follow suit, right, then you won't have anything in common. You know, maybe you you, you won't be able to hang out anymore. Maybe maybe uh, they won't be attracted to you in the same way that you they used to be. All this stuff can go through your head. But if that's your perception, the the autopilot thing that sometimes happens is that even if people don't consciously intend to do it, they will say things to discourage you from moving forward. And it's not because they're concerned about you. Mm -hmm. It's because they're deep down. It's like a defensive mechanism where they're concerned about being left behind. Mm -hmm. Right. Or it's just the fact that your progress makes them very uncomfortable yeah. because it's like a mirror. Yeah. You know, you making progress and your ability to do this and to confront the things that have kept you from seeing progress and 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 you're learning and you're growing and you're overcoming obstacles puts a mirror in front of other people's faces that they're not doing it and or or they're there that they're not taking the time uh, or or prioritizing or making the same changes and the main, same moves and and that makes them feel bad yeah. right so a lot of the comments you have to really stop and ask yourself in every case i always go back to the four agreements which is an amazing book by don miguel ruiz totally changed my life okay the the four agreements are essentially uh number one be impeccable with your word and if you apply that to this situation you would never say some of these things to someone else like you would never insert yourself into their journey by saying or giving them or telling them your opinion about whether they need to lose weight or not um if you're being impeccable with your word, you just wouldn't do that. But the second agreement is don't take anything personally mm -hmm. and to recognize that what other people say and do has everything to do with them and nothing to do with you. Mm -hmm. So when you look at other people's comments and perceptions of you and your journey and their opinions that they may be giving you, when you filter it through that lens that it's actually what they're saying is about them, not about you, 
you can really let go of that. And you can understand that their opinion really is truly none of your business because it's about them, not you. Mm -hmm. And, and they're, they're on a deeper subconscious level, what they're saying or doing is really more self-serving and filling their own deeper human needs than it is trying to preserve yours. Um, and then the third agreement in the four agreements is, um, I'm blanking on it. Be impeccable with your word. Never take anything personally. Never make assumptions. Mm -hmm. Right? So if you apply that here, you apply that to this, never assume that when someone says something that they have your best interest at heart. You just can't do that. Mm -hmm. Because if you're assuming that they have your best interest at heart, then you're, you're going to take what they say very personally. Mm -hmm. Right? And you can't do that. And then... The last one is just to, just to do your best, right? So a little bit of a primer on the four agreements. If you haven't read the four agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz and you struggle with receiving other people's opinions, thoughts, perceptions, comments regarding your journey and you struggle, um, you know, what you're doing is working, but now you're questioning it because of what other people are saying. You're questioning, do I need to keep losing? Should I just stop here? You know, is what I'm doing healthy? All that stuff. When you have experts telling you, and, and it is working, the four agreements is a great framework to help you process through that among many other things in life. I think hundred percent. What other, what other thoughts or uh, things would you add to this before we move on to the last one? Um, for the setback, I, I think we kind of, <laughs> we kind of mixed the two in a way. Um, yeah. But I, I think as far as, uh, you know, setback to come back, um, well, let me intro intro that here real quick because I didn't. Yeah. So the last question basically is how do we go from setback to comeback? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this this is just really around every person on the journey is going to have multiple setbacks. There is no journey where setbacks don't happen. Mm -hmm. um, they're either going to happen when you're trying to get to your goal, or there are some rare about ten percent of our clients actually don't experience many setbacks getting, if any, to all the way to their goal. But then the setbacks happen after they're at their goal. Yeah. And that's dangerous because I think you actually want the setbacks to happen right. when you're trying to get to your goal. That's a little bit more realistic and you can learn along the way. It's actually worse when the setbacks don't come until you get to your goal because then you're really cocky. Right. And you can be overconfident and you can get really blown over by those and end up gaining the weight back. But so setback to comeback. How do we go from setback to comeback? Um, what are your thoughts? Uh, I mean, it's kind of like uh, you know during our last conversation uh, around failure. It's the the perception around a setback. I mean, a setback is essentially you know kind of like a failure. Mm -hmm. um, if you view the setback as something that is something you'll never be able to overcome, then yeah. you're going to be constantly stuck. Um, you know, such as like emotional eating or something, you know, you get there mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, well, this is something that I can never fix. And then yeah. I'm just stuck here forever. I am, uh, you know, broken. I'll never be able to be fixed, um, which is totally false. And the, the totally. setbacks are really just kind of reminders that, you know, we're making progress and, and this is just another wall that we need to break through. Yep. Um, just another hill to climb and mm -hmm. something to learn about ourselves, which is, I think is, is super important. And I look forward to setbacks yeah. because then... And Drop your mic a little oh, bit more. There you go. Oh, yeah. There you go. Sorry. You're drifting. I'm drifting. Um, but, uh, you know, you kind of look forward to setbacks because it's just something that, you know, you, you it's another challenge that you can can overcome. Yeah. Uh, that's at least my perception on, on the setback to come back. Uh, yeah. the, the comeback is is mostly just kind of overcoming the, the setbacks in a way. So, well, yeah, it's just getting back to what was already working. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think you're on the right track. I think that. The biggest, probably the biggest thing that, that holds people back is their perception of the setback, mm -hmm. right? And there's a couple things that come up. I mean, number one, we have already talked about the relationship with failure and false beliefs around that. So if you missed that episode, that was our first episode together where we talked about um, many of the false beliefs that hold people back. But yeah, if, you're, if your perception of failure and you have a very, per, very poor relationship with failure, then you view failure and setbacks as something that are like death. You know, they're, they're horrible. And you, you allow your setbacks or your failures to, you take them deeply personally. Mm -hmm. You know, like they're a part of who you are. 
and it, you, you struggle then to get back on track, right? Um, but the reality is that, you know, setbacks happen. And like you said, setbacks are really a crucial part of the journey because setbacks highlight and raise red flags to highlight gaps of knowledge and skill that you have not yet filled in that if you want to be long-term successful, you've got to fill in, right? So let's take a common setback you mentioned earlier in, in the uh, podcast, which was um, a surgery or a medical issue, right? This, step, this happens all the time to people. Um, you know, you're doing really good, you're, you're making great changes, you're being more active, you're working out, you're making changes with your food, um, and all of those things are coming together to create, excuse me, to create a calorie deficit and you're seeing progress. And then something happens, you know, you get kidney stones or you, um, you, you, you have some other, you know, a bulging disc in your lower back or you tweak your knee, something happens. And now all of the sudden you can't be as active as you were. You can't walk eight to 10,000 steps a day. You can't do any strength training. And now all of a sudden your calories in calories out equation, half of that equation is gone. And now in order to see results, you have to rely completely almost on one, which is food, right? And so this can happen. And let's say when you go through a, a, series, a season like that, what that is doing, yes, it's a setback. Yes, in the short term, your results will slow down or come to a halt potentially. And if you're not careful, if you don't have coaching and guidance through those seasons, um, or if you do have coaching and guidance and you do what a lot of people do is just they isolate and they lean away from their, their coaches and their guides during that time, which is a whole different conversation. Um, but if you do have coaches and mentors to guide you through that, you can actually navigate that most of the time while at least maintaining, at the very least maintaining your, your progress that you've already made. But if you do it right, you can actually still be successful losing weight through those seasons. But what that's highlighting, that setback highlights for you is that you don't know how to control your weight when you can't be active. Mm -hmm. There's knowledge and skill around how do I rely completely on food to still see progress or to maintain my progress when I can't be active due to a, um, sorry, my nose is running, um, due to a setback physically. And there's a lot of things that you could do. You could implement um, a number of different formats of intermittent fasting. Um, you could make some tweaks to your food, um, eating, eating more of certain types of foods and less of others to create um, the calorie deficit that you, that you needed primarily with food. There's actually a large number of tweaks that we could make that could allow you to still make consistent progress even when you can't be active. But what that setback has done is it has shown you a hole in your plan and your strategy and in your, um, in your knowledge and your skill. So what do we do with that? We've got to fill in that knowledge gap and, and plug that hole so that once you do that, from that point forward in your life, every time you get a physical setback, you know exactly what to do, mm -hmm. right? So now all of a sudden, the setback is not this big, hairy, scary, horrible thing that we need to be depressed and we need to be sad and we need to be angry and frustrated about. When you really reframe it, the setback is extremely valuable. Yeah. The setback is something that you actually can become grateful and thankful for rather than like, why does this happen to me? Why does it have to be this poor woe is me? You know, setbacks are a good thing, mm -hmm. ultimately. 100%. So I think I'm glad you brought that up. I think that's the first thing that we have to do is we have to stop and we have to say, it is not, this, this setback is not the end for me. It's not the beginning of the end. This is not where I start to gain all the weight back. I mean, it could be. It could be if you are going to pour woe is me your way through the setback. But if, and if you're going to isolate and lean away from your coaches and mentors who, who have all of the knowledge and skill to coach you through it, then yeah, absolutely. You're going to gain the weight back. You're going to go right back to where you started. But if you lean into your coaches and your mentors and you help them to fill in those knowledge gaps for you, you can navigate it successfully and then you can then be equipped moving forward with what you need. So your perception of the setback is, without a doubt, probably the most important thing. Yeah. The other thing I want to highlight that I think is important because all of this stuff goes together mm -hmm. is 
if you're having a setback and all of a sudden you are not eating the foods that you used to eat to get the results or all of a sudden you're not doing the workouts or you're not doing the steps even if you physically can do them, once again, why is that? Right? Nobody has to push you to do things that you like to do. So once again, when you have a setback in life, it usually highlights one of two big red flag issues or one of three. One, you don't have knowledge and skills that need to be set, you know, plug that hole like we already talked about. Number two, once again, you're still relying on things that you haven't reached the required level or threshold of enjoyment and intrinsic motivation in to get the results. And when life got stressful, you struggled to keep doing them and you started maybe to, to turn back to old habits or to just stop doing the things. That's the second thing. The third thing is that it probably highlighted that you have a problem with emotional eating mm-hmm. or stress eating and that we need to address that, right? So setbacks are not bad. Setbacks are good. They raise red flags so that we can tackle the issues that would eventually prevent you from being long-term successful. So the earlier you have the setbacks in your journey, the earlier you can lean into your coaches and your mentors to, to fill those gaps or to tackle the monsters like emotional eating or stress eating or to figure out that, oh, yeah, I'm still, I still don't have the variety or the enjoyment in my food yet or I still haven't layered enough things or found the right types of exercise or workouts that I would want to continue doing. Setbacks highlight problems that we can solve. And that's, my, that's the way I frame up a setback. And then the comeback is just addressing those things that that setback is highlighting, yep. basically. Because once you address all those things, you address your tendency to emotionally eat and stress eat, you address any gaps of knowledge that, that you needed to with those, you have addressed the enjoyment level of, and the threshold, then really now you don't have setbacks. Once you've done all of these things, you know life can happen and it doesn't impact you. Right? You could lose your job, you know, you could get sick, you could, you could, you know, blow out your knee, you could get into a car wreck, you could um, lose a loved one. You know, there's a lot of stuff that happens in life that is hard. But when you don't have a problem, you've already nicked your problem with, with addiction or emotional eating or stress eating. You've learned how to, to operate, even if you can only use one tool at a time to lose weight, being it food or exercise and not both. You have, uh, figured out the things that you love to do that also get you results, what setback could there be that would actually be a setback? So my encouragement to everybody is when you experience setbacks, be like, take a moment and practice gratitude for that setback because you can learn and grow from that setback in ways that are permanent, that, that will permanently enable you to become the skilled, capable person that won't be impacted by that same setback in the same way again, if you handle it in the right way. Yeah, 100%. It's all based on perception. It's all based on perception, which if you have not figured it out yet, listening to us talk back and forth, I firmly believe that 90% of this journey is the mental game. Oh, yeah. 90% of it is the mental game. Yeah. The food, learning you know, the, the basic knowledge skills around food and nutrition and exercise and activity and learning how to produce a calorie deficit in a way that you actually do enjoy does not take that long. It happens typically within four to eight weeks with our clients. The rest of the time that we work with our clients, like Pam, Pam's going on two years with us. She's been at her goal weight for a long time. She's still coaching and mentoring with us. Why? She's still working at a deeper level. And what I love about Pam is that she is not willing to settle for good. She has committed herself to achieving and experiencing great Mm -hmm. in her life with her health, physically, mentally, and emotionally. Mm -hmm. So... I think that's about it. I think we covered all of these. I think we covered a lot of great points. Yeah. Um, if you are listening to this and you have not yet subscribed to our channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the like button because the algorithm really likes that. And uh, yeah, we're glad you guys came. 
Love that you guys spend time with us, and we'll see you in the next episode. Indeed. Deuces. Deuces.